So I've uploaded some of the presentations already, so for episode zero, that is the introduction to the course, and then also on life, uh, so that's episode number one. This is going to be episode number two, but before I get into that, I just want you to know that the assessment is uploaded and it should be available for you at noon tomorrow, and it will be open till, until 10 o'clock. Just a few caveats in here, How, however, there are some stipulations in Blackboard now that didn't exist before. You have to uh, actually take that assessment in a in the within the span of two hours. It's going to actually actually ask you to finish it in one sitting if you if you if you could. There are only ten questions, okay? <laughs> and it, regardless of how you score on it, and I don't expect you to score well. I'm asking you some tough questions on there, and so but those are the kind of things that you'll be able to answer later on. So what you're going to see there are 10 questions. It'll take you about maybe 20 minutes at the most, maybe not even that, probably even less than that, maybe 10 minutes at the most uh, to finish that pre-course assessment. And so uh, once you get that done, it will be recorded. And then I'll go back into Blackboard and make sure you, uh, whoever completes that gets the five points of extra credit. Anyway, that, hopefully that'll clear that up for you. <coughs> um it won't be available until noon, however, either. So don't try to log in early and send me an email that says, hey, it's not open at 11.50, okay? Uh, you have to wait till noon for it to be available. So, okay, with that out of the way, what else to tell you? Um, I also put out, I, well, I'm going to be putting out a bunch of announcements, uh, I guess, through time, too. You can get the Audible online version of the book, uh, so it'll actually read it to you if you want. Um, I've been listening to it this afternoon and, and part of this evening. Um, and it's entertaining. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. I don't know if it's going to be your favorite book because he's a little bit stilted in his ideas. I think he's trying to be a great writer or something. But uh, yeah, it didn't come across that way for me. Um, but it's okay. It's okay. It's a good story anyway. So that that's kind of important, I think. Okay. With that out of the way. Episode 2, Time. And we're going to start this a little obscurely, actually, because time is kind of an interesting sort of concept. Okay, so in this image, what you see here is a Rolex. Now, obviously, Rolexes are pretty handy, but but and you might say, well, that's a wonderful watch. I think it's an oyster watch is what they call those. And Rolexes are in demand by everybody, right? Uh, you can always tell a great watch because the sweep second hand doesn't tick, 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 tick like uh, quartz movement would do. And so this one has a, a movement that is very smooth and and, and um, people have trusted that brand for years and years. It's a very expensive brand as well. That's why I don't own one. Um, one of the things about... This particular watch, when you look at it up here, it actually has some marks around the bezel on the out, well, not on the bezel, but on the uh, perimeter of the crystal here. And uh, you can actually see there's a 10 and a 20, 30, 40, 50, and then there would be 60 at the top, then or zero. Um, it's a chronometer. And so chronometers are a little bit different than watches in the fact that you can actually use them to tell velocity. But, uh, but a chronometer... Is very handy in uh, some sports, let's say. Um, behind that watch, okay, and I use the metaphor here of Time Magazine, okay. I'm pretty goofy that way, I guess, but uh, we use Life Magazine. Last time I'm using Time Magazine for the template. It's a made-up photograph in this situation. The photograph is real enough, but uh, but in fact the, the magazine outline here is kind of a, an artificial sort of construct. Uh, but the tree that you see behind that watch right there, that's called the Methuselah tree. And that tree actually stands in California. It's in the White Mountains, and it's the oldest living tree, oldest living known tree on Earth. Um, and it is about 4,853 years old, according to records. So they have cored this tree or counted the rings in it <clears throat> without killing it, mind you. And nobody knows exactly where it is. Well, I'm sure a few people may know, but but most commonly people do not know where that tree is. So the Methuselah tree, in the middle of a stand of bristlecone pines at the very top of the White Mountains, um, is in California. 
And uh, so we're going to look at trees a little bit this time with a, with the idea of time in there as well. So if that's 4,800, almost, almost 4,900 years old, right? So we want to talk about trees in a lot of different aspects. So we're going to talk about the tree of life. And people talk about evolution that way and how all living organisms are related to one another. And then we're also going to talk about life as it compares to time. And we want to ask the question, in fact, during this one, if we if we ask what is life last time, we're going to ask what is time this time. Um, and then also we want to look at a few other basic concepts. Uh, do time machines work and how do we measure time? And so we're, we'll take it from there. Um, time is a metamorph for metaphor for longevity. It's a metaphor for diversity. You can have branches of different things, right? And it's a metaphor for a metaphor for evolution as well. And so oftentimes in the past, people have drawn evolutionary trees that would relate, let's say, a family of cats. Okay, so cats, like the domestic cat is over here, ocelot, the tiger, the lion, and so forth. And they're all related to one another, but they go off on different branches that way. And so that's a metaphor for evolution, the tree of life, if you will. And it's also a metaphor for how we measure time in human um, ideas, right? And so um, most trees are really much, much older. No, well, some trees are much older than what people are. So on the right-hand side of this image, you are going to actually see the one of the first evolutionary trees ever drawn that shows a relationship between finches and the Galapagos Islands. This image right here is famous because Charles Darwin did that image, and it shows the relationships between different bird beaks and, and, and the sort of foods that they might eat. You know, So there are some seed crackers, insectivores. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of finches that wound up in the Galapagos Islands. And of course, if if you use your imagination, you could say one big storm blew all of these different species out there, but that's probably not the case. And what probably is the case is there was at least a breeding pair or at least a pregnant female. <laughs> pregnant if you get an egg, I guess. In any way, anyway, one of the females was laying eggs out on the Galapagos Islands and, uh, and gave rise to what we would call today a founder species. And the founder species would be the first one that arrived. And then because animals tend to fit into the ecological niches that are around them or try to find the the easiest and most easily exploitable food source, uh, they developed in different beak styles. And so Charles Darwin is the first guy to explore that. He did it with a shotgun. <laughs> he, he shot the birds and then stuffed them and then brought them back, you know, to study. Um, but at the same time, he learned a lot from that. And so sometimes science is destructive, which is kind of a sad thing. And so that brings us to the next part here. Um, what you see here is a photograph of another bristlecone pine, or the remains of a bristlecone pine known as Prometheus. Now, Prometheus is in Great Basin National Park in the eastern part of Nevada. It's like on the opposite side from where you saw Methuselah. Methuselah is over in the White Mountains in California on the eastern side in the Snake Range of, of eastern Nevada. You would find Great Basin National Park and up in a, a large uh, a glacial uh, valley at the very top of that mountain range, very near the top of that mountain range at about 11,000 feet. Bristlecone pines stand in there, and there's several of them that are several thousand years old, maybe 25, 28. So uh, when they cut Prometheus down, by accident, I should say, we know who did it. <laughs> it was a graduate student, and his name was Donald Rusk Curry. Uh, he did this in 1964 as a graduate student to find out how old are these things. Oh, let's cut one down, find out, and cut the count the rings. And when he counted the rings up, he found that it was 4,900 years old. Now, that's about 50 years older than Methuselah. So uh, you what puts this into perspective. That tree was planted about... 200 years before the Egyptians started building the pyramids. And then it was, well, okay, if that gives you any sort of indication, it's the about 20, 2900 BC. Okay, so human beings had just <laughs> developed the capacity to make writing, okay, at that time. Uh, just, just beyond that, in fact. Um, so maybe that was back a little bit farther, but, but not much farther than that. 
So Prometheus was cut down, which was a very, very sad story. As it turns out, uh, Dr. Curry became a professor of geology at a university in Western North America here. I won't tell you what university because I don't want you to form bad associations, but um, he was very sorry for what he did. Uh, but he didn't know how old it was until he cut it down. And so, you know, mistakes are made. Uh, you can't murder a tree. You can murder people. But, you know, and in this case, if it's the same sort of situation, you would even call it manslaughter of a tree. Okay, so it wasn't intentional uh, to, to just destroy the tree for no reason whatsoever. Um, here's a photograph, some of my photographs, in fact, of that same area. I work out in that area in the Great Basin. And this is the... Uh, that's the valley you can see here. There's actually a glacier at the head of that valley on the right-hand side. The uh, the genus for this is Pinus longeva. <laughs> That's, you know, for the bristlecone pine. On the left-hand side, it's one of the older trees there as well. As it turns out, these bristlecone pines are really, really uh, dense woods, and so they actually pack the, the, the rings really, really closely together. And in fact, it's illegal not only to cut these things down, it's also illegal to collect the wood. You can't break the wood off. You can't collect pieces of deadfall even. It's against, it's a federal crime. Let me put it that way to be able to do that. Um, so don't do it <laughs> um, if you're ever out in that area. Um, you will recognize the grandeur of these sorts of things. However, they're 11,000 11, feet up and many of them are over 3,000 years old. So those are the bristlecone pines of Great Basin National Park in eastern Nevada. Um, the ones in the White Mountains are a little bit more difficult to get to. So, you know, don't even try to get there, I guess is what I would say. There are some trees, in fact, so we're talking about old trees here, right? And how old they are compared to human civilizations even, right? To give you some perspective on, on how old people can relate to trees. And so this, in fact, is one of the oldest trees in Europe. And uh, it's a it's a yew tree, and it's from Wales. It's from Powys, and it is the Saint Sinek uh, tree. In okay, let me get this right. I, I I've spelled it here, and I don't speak Welsh much. I speak a little bit, but not much. Thlan Thlangernwe Thlangernwe yew here, and so this is a yew tree, and they, you'll find yew trees commonly in church grounds there, and so in those sorts of settings. The churches were often built in sacred sites, and in this case, that U is probably related to Druids, um, because Druids, the ancient Celts that lived in this area that were Welsh, uh, worship trees. I, I guess in a way I kind of do too, you know, but so here's a Welsh tree, and, it's, and that one dates back 5,000 years. It's an estimate, however. They didn't core it or anything like that, but about 5,000 years old, so it's roughly in the same ballpark age, give or take 100 years of what the two bristlecone pines that I've already shown you are. Um, so yew trees are really pretty spectacular. Here's a couple right here. I've seen these before, actually. The, the two on the left-hand side here, that's a the Taxus uh, Bacata, and uh, this is the Isbiti Even Yews in Conway, Wales. And these are a mere 1,100 years old. Okay, so, well, there's two of them. There's another one that's slightly bigger than that that I'm taking the photograph from that direction. Um, Wales is known for their trees and their druids. And, of course, here is a uh, St. Ilted Cecil Oak. So Cecil Oaks can grow to great size as well. And those oaks probably are closer to the age of about 500 years. So trees, and that's Quercus uh, Petri. Uh, so the, the, the uh, Cecil Oak is what they call it in, in Britain. And it's unusual, in fact. So these oak trees actually set their acorns on upside down, essentially, and hanging on to a branch, okay? So uh, not on little stems and things like that. So it's an unusual sort of, sort, uh, sort of tree. Now, if we've been talking about old trees, right, or trees that have a certain sort of amount of grandeur to them, and if you really want to see the really amazing ones, you go to California, the ones for grandeur anyway, um, and that would be the Sequoia sempervirens. The one on the left-hand side in this image, that's a coast redwood there, and that's in uh, the, it's a, it's the, it's called the Advocate Tree. It's in the Forest of Nicene Marks. It's a state park in California. It's 55 feet around. It's massive, 
and it's quite tall. Here's a student. That's a Missouri State University student right there looking upward at it. We got to visit this back in, I think, about 2015 or so when we uh, did a field trip to California for our students. It was a, it was technically a study away trip, but uh, in California, it was far enough away. They thought that it would be very beneficial for our students to go on a, on a study away trip. So what you see here on the right-hand side is another type of redwood. And so I've tried to indicate that with the green and the red highlighting on the uh, word, words on here. Uh, the green side over here, that's the Sequoia Sempervirens range. It goes all the way into southernmost Oregon, and it stretches all the way down beyond Big Sur in California along the coast, right? So that's the coast redwoods. The ones in red or pink over here are in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and there's quite a few places where they're located, but the ones in Sequoia National Park are what they call the sequoia trees, right? The, this, the genus is Sequoia dendron. The species, of course, is Sequoia dendron giganteum. So it's a slightly different species than what Sequoia sempervirens is which is kind of cool. Okay, so some of them grow in the mountains in very dry conditions, and some of them live in the coastal areas where it is very moist, and so they, they feed off of the fog that comes off of the cold North Pacific Ocean there. Now, with that in mind, <laughs> um, those are two species of redwoods. They found a fossil redwood, okay, so this brings in the life of the past. They found a fossil redwood in the 1930s, I think it was, or 1920s even, maybe, in Oregon. And then they began to find this in the circum-Pacific sort of area. So they found fossil redwood leaves and cones in some of the rocks that are Eocene in age, and I think also Miocene in age. And um, you can see what the leaves kind of look like here. They're related to cypress trees. Uh, so in fact, they named that species Metasequoia glyptostroboides, and with those fossils in mind, so you had some in Oregon, you have some in 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 Japan, and so in 1948, just after World War II had had finished, there was a botanist. He was a Chinese botanist, and he lived in Lushan, in Hubei province in China, and he described a living redwood tree and it matched the fossil wood that they had found and the fossil leaves and, and cones and so forth they had found in Oregon and Japan. All of a sudden it opened up this brand new species and it was discovered in one little tiny valley and I think there were about 500 members in that valley. What you see on the right hand side is a result of the effort of Several people, in fact, mostly from Princeton University, I think it is. In Princeton University, they recognized in 1948, if somebody found that redwood there, we've got to preserve that and make sure that it does not go extinct. And so they went out and they, they put out an expedition to go out and find that Redwood Valley and then to collect samples of it. And what they did is they propagated it. Uh, they propagated it several ways, in fact, and so they brought those um, cuttings back and the roots and some of the cones and so forth, and they brought it back to the United States and a few other places around the world so that tree wouldn't go extinct. And um, at that time, in the early 1960s we're talking about now, maybe mid-1960s by this time, one of the professors at Missouri State University said, I want some of those. And he requested some of those. And of course, because it was distant enough away from Princeton, it's like, oh, this is a good idea. Let's send some of these cuttings to Springfield, Missouri. And they did. And they planted them on the campus of Missouri State University. Well, back then it was Southwest Missouri State Teachers College, I think but our state university. And anyway, it was SMSU for a while. Now it's Missouri State. If you go out in front of Carrington Hall, you will find several redwood trees. And you look at them and you say, well, that's a redwood? And it's like, yeah, it's a redwood. It's about 60 years old. And they're about three feet across, maybe three and a half at the very most. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see what the living ones look like. I can vouch for that, in fact. I was so impressed by the story of finding a living member of something that was thought to be only fossil. 
that I even bought one myself, okay? Uh, my wife and I lost several trees in 2007 due to an ice storm. And Springfield gets clobbered by ice all the time, right? I lost a beautiful Japanese elm tree. The thing split in three different directions. It had to be, you know, removed. I was using a chainsaw for about three weeks after that, after the ice storm. But we were able to clear that one out. And I ordered from National Harbor Day a Dawn Redwood is what the common name is for these things. So it is the Metasequoia glyptostroboides. Stroboides. And um, it is a beautiful tree. If you leave the lower branches on these things, they develop these sort of uh, prop roots around the edge here. So they're buttress roots, if you will. They kind of support the tree. Uh, they grow very, very rapidly, and they're estimated to grow up to about 120 or 150 feet high when they're fully grown. I'm looking forward to that. I won't be around when it finally finishes its growth, but uh, well, hopefully nobody will cut it down. They'll recognize what it is. Um, so that is a kind of a cool story about how fossils and living trees kind of interfinger with one. I don't know. It's the past and the present coming together, isn't it? One of the other privileges I have as a professor at Missouri State University, I just got back from Jamaica, as you know, and so in Bluefields, it's a it's a town along the west southwestern coast of Jamaica. It's one of the places we visit and spend a lot of time with the people who are there. Uh, at Belmont Academy, this is a little town just south of Bluefields here. At Belmont Academy, there are several what, uh, trees that are called silk cotton trees or ceiba trees. And ceiba trees, in fact, were enormous. They grow to enormous size. They grow pretty fast. And the native uh, Taino cultures used to take a single tree and they would carve out of a single ceiba tree a dugout canoe. And these canoes would be several meters long and have the velocity of like nine knots or ten knots when they're paddled. So very soft wood, but very, 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 very good for like dugout canoes and so forth. So I got to see these when I was down there. Some of them are absolutely enormous. This is a close-up of a couple of these, and you can see how they kind of have the same types of buttress sort of roots at the bottom, makes them very, very interesting sort of trees. Now, if you talk about trees as a concept, we usually think about a, one tree, right? You don't think about trees as being members of a community, let's say. Well, trees grow in communities, but they're individuals, right? Not always. As it turns out, there are trees like the aspen tree, which has a whole network of roots. And as it turns out, aspen trees will turn colors all at the same time. It depends on where they're at. And it's a whole colony that behaves that way. And so it, the colonies themselves can grow to be quite old. And so I think that some of the colonies can be up to like over almost 15,000 years old. I think the oldest the oldest is about 14,000 years old. They're called corms. And so they grow like putting on rhizomes. They actually spread by roots. They don't, it's not by the seeds. And so the roots spread out across the landscape. Although they put on seeds too, they can be dispersed that way from valley to valley. But these are large stands of aspens. Of course, here's one that has a road cut through it. This is in the Snake Range. <laughs> well, actually, it's in the Duck Creek Range in uh, Nevada. And um, in that colony, is it, it's in between the, the Duck Creek Range on the, on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is the, is the uh, Shell Creek Range. And so, uh, absolutely beautiful when you see these things in person. But that is an example of a colony of trees. And they can go up to be quite old. I think one of the oldest colony types of preservations is in the California deserts of the, of this, say, um, oh, what's the name? It's, it's not Sonoran Desert. It's the Chihuahua. It's not, I, I can't remember which it is, but it's out in Eastern Ca uh, California. And it's a, uh, it's a creosote bush. It's a creosote bush that was, it started at one place and then spread outward like, like you see, like, uh, like a uh, sort of mold growing outward in a petri dish, let's say. And so it grows outward like that. And it was estimated to be about 20,000 years old. Trees and time are like this, right? So they go together. Um, 
This is an interesting tree right here. Now this tree is about 2300 years old, not as old as any of the bristle cones or anything like that. But this one's more interesting for its association with humans. And so this is in India, obviously, in Bihar. And this is known as the Mahabodhi tree. And the Mahabodhi tree is the tree under which um, uh, Siddhartha, I think it is, uh, Lord Siddhartha, who became the Buddha. He became enlightened. This is where he gained enlightenment, sitting under this tree and meditating. He's the prince who was locked up in his castle by his father for the long period of time because he didn't want his son to see the suffering of the world. And of course, the Buddha, uh, once he broke free of the confines of the palace, he got to see things like people suffering and people dying and all these things that he had no experience with. And in this, he came up with what they call the Four Noble Truths, right? So life is suffering, there's an end to suffering, there's an eightfold path to that end to suffering, and uh, there was one other in there, but uh, we can, this isn't a Buddhist class right here. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, if you look at magnificent trees, you have to go to Africa as well. The baobab trees in Africa, this is an area right here called the Avenue of the Baobabs, they have a capacity to retain some water and maintain themselves in a savanna setting like this. They're absolutely magnificent trees, very majestic trees. The sad thing is the very largest ones are actually dying off. So nine of the largest, nine of the 13 oldest baobab trees in Africa have died in the last few years. Um, the oldest, let's see, the, the largest one died in 2017, okay? But this is a photograph of it here. And that's a baobab that was turned into a bar, and so people would go inside and have their drinks, whatever. And uh, the, that's the Platteland uh, baobab here, but it, it died in 2017. Um, some of the other connotations with baobabs are... The Little Prince. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read that book. It's a very short read. It is very, uh, it's a delightful read. It was actually written in French. It's been interpreted into English, uh, but it was written by a World War I uh, French pilot who was flying over Africa. And he, his part of his experiences were rolled into this story, I guess you could say, and he was tragically killed later on in that conflict. Um, here is the little prince, of course, on the little tiny planet, or the little asteroid, asteroid B612, and it was uh, brimming with baobabs, but he would have to come along and trim the baobabs or they would take over the whole planet. He'd have no place to go and no place for his little red rose that he loves so dearly. Um, this is trees we're talking about here. So if we talk about trees, we also have to think about the mythical trees that people associate with humans. And that would be things like the, well, in the Garden of Eden, right? So it's the tree that gave us the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life is supposed to have been in there as well. And so here's a couple of different images that show trees from an extraordinary painter, a middle, middle, middle ages painter. His name was Hieronymus Bosch. So he lived from 1450, 1516. He's the guy who did... Uh, and, the, and the, part of this is from the Garden of Earthly Delights. It was a triptych that was painted, and it hangs, I forget where. I think it's its not in the Louvre. It's actually in a cathedral. Uh, St. Jerome at prayer over here on the right-hand side. So I'm not sure what that is, actually. But uh, And so trees play a major role even in, in the Western culture, right? So it's not Africa only. It's not in Native American America. Um, and it's not just in Jamaica and the Caribbean or anything like that. Here you see trees that, that found their way into, well, in European culture. Also the yew trees, of course, in Wales. Uh, and it's not just exclusively there. When one goes to Japan, you see a lot of tree imagery as well. So here's the plum tree from a sliding screen. Now this is the 17th century, and that's called the Kano uh, Sanraku and uh, it's a door, essentially, right? So four panels there to show a plum tree. That was very old when this artist painted it. Um, other trees. In Japan, they revere trees, and so they have a tree that has bloomed for many, many centuries. From And the tree's about 
2,170 years old. The one on the right there is. The one on the left is actually estimated to be 7,800 years old. Or 7,200 years, up to 7,200 years old. Nobody gets to touch these things. So nobody's going to core these trees. But that is the... Uh, the uh, cherry tree that you see in the top up here. And if you look at it, you can see where all of the major branches are actually propped up by poles to keep them from breaking. And in fact, uh, there's a tree like that. I think it's a, I think it's a cherry tree. I, I, I'd have to check on it, but south of Springfield along Highway 176 in between Highlandville and the road to Branson 65 there, there's actually a tree that's quite old, estimated to be about 300 years old. And I think, I don't know if it's a cherry tree. It's a, yeah, I don't know exactly what kind of tree it is. My wife knows, but she's gone to bed already. Um, the other kind of tree down here at the bottom, I don't know the common name for it, but that is a tree that's quite old, 7,200 years old on the left-hand side. So it's much smaller, in fact, than even the, the cherry tree over here on the right-hand side that's 2,200 years old, roughly. If we just look at, at the majest, majestic aspects of trees, um, one of those would be the the dragon trees. This is on Socotra Island. Now, Socotra Island belongs to the the country of Yemen. Yemen is in revolt right now, but the island is far enough offshore that, as far as I know, Anyway, the revolution hasn't spread there, but uh, this is what the trees look like. That's not, that's not the cover of an album. That is not like, yes, albums used to have that sort of structure, right? Uh, that is a tree that lives in a very arid place in between, what's well, in the Indian Ocean. It's, it's right at the junction between the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the, well, they call it, uh, 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 Djibouti, right? The country of Djibouti. So it's just off of Yemen there. And uh, other places where there are magnificent forests, but n not necessarily just trees, but they're tree-sized, things like club mosses. And so that's what you see here in the ruins of Ori. Now this is back in Africa, in, in Uganda. In Uganda they have these giant club mosses that grow up six, eight, ten feet high. And uh, so it's an, er an entire area that is volcanic landscape, but it's over 10,000 feet high here. It has some uh, glaciers, I think, at the very uh, top of this, very close to equatorial latitudes. Uh, but those are some of the unusual plants here. I think Lobelia is one of the other species in here as well. So Lobelia and the club mosses here really grow to enormous sizes. Well, let's talk about the metaphor now. So what is the tree of life? So we've looked at a lot of different kinds of trees and even colonies of trees, but the tree of life in this illustration is that it goes back to probably the 1800s, uh, maybe a little into the 1700s as well. But here, the mythical sort of aspect of the tree of life, in this case, it's growing from the continent here that has all of the, the rivers draining that continent and the rocks at the core of it and the mountains and so forth with the tree at the top up there. Trees around the perimeter, but then that ice barrier for the flat earth around the perimeter of this thing. And of course the underworld below that, right? And so that is Hades down below and heaven above, of course. And so that is the tree of life illustrated probably from a Christian perspective, I would guess. But it's not just the Christians who have the tree of life. There are older forms. They come from places like Persia uh, that predate Christianity. And so the one on the left-hand side is from, I think that's from the uh, Farsi, well, it's from ancient Iran or ancient, um, uh, yeah, ancient Iran there, Persian king, uh, Persian empire at that time. And then there would be, you know, drawings and paintings and so forth and the illuminated manuscripts in Islamic culture as well. Now, it's illegal to make some drawings in Islamic culture, but here you can see that I think those are pomegranates. And so that may, in fact, be just a, some other Middle Eastern sort of uh, representation of a tree of life. But it shows pomegranates. Well, pomegranates are what people ate back then, right? And so another form of that tree of life, if you will. Now... When we talk about the tree of life as a metaphor for evolution, here's a tree here that shows the relationship about how things would branch off of that tree. Going from bacteria on the left-hand side all the way to snakes on the right-hand side, of course, 
the epitome of evolution, of course, humans at the very top up here, at the, right next to whales and chimpanzees, of course, the intelligent or sentient beings that are part of, you know, animal kingdom, you might say. Um, but at a lower levels along the tree, they show you the sponges and the jellyfishes and the mollusks and the mushrooms and the yeasts and so forth. But it is a metaphor for evolution. And we know already that everything comes from uh, organisms that have, well, living things that have RNA and DNA in their structure. And of course, that's how things can evolve from one thing to another. Now, if we go back to some of the earliest representations of that evolution, it's not always tree form like that, but here you can see where people have used that same sort of plant growth, if you will, going up in branches and then branching off, and then some of the branches will end, and then other ones continue on. And here you can see the plants on the left and the animals on the right. The interesting thing about this is on the far right-hand side and the far left-hand side, you can see that there are geologic ages placed on this that shows you when these things branched off from one another. Now, this is a very old paleontological chart, but it shows you that people have always had this sort of ingrained idea about the importance of trees and representing things. And so that is an ancient form of how we look at paleontology, I guess, and the relatedness of all living creatures. And if we look at that relatedness today and we wanted to look for a tree sort of metaphor, this is the sort of diagram that you would see associated with that. And this shows relatedness. And so this is actually a kind of a spiral or circular cladogram. And it should, well, it's not really a cladogram, but it's more of a tree, I guess you could say. We'll get into cladograms later in this class, but uh, cladograms are very important for showing relationships between fossil organisms and, in fact, living organisms, li living organisms as well. So, uh, one more uh, try at a, uh, a tree here. This is one that relates RNA sequences to the lower forms in the in the living realm, I guess you could say. So archaea, cyanobacteria, or cyano, cyano um, what do we call them? Uh, the crypt uh, microbial sort of creatures as well. And so we have bacteria, protists, and all these sort of things. And then finally, the eukaryotes, right? So the eukaryotes are well, slightly more advanced because they have a cell nucleus in, in them, but they do have RNA as well. And so here you can see the relationship between these based on actual data. And so the actual data, <clears throat> pardon me, the actual data shows the relatedness of those organisms. So with that in mind, let's talk about humans now. We've talked about trees. Who's the oldest person alive? Well, it used to be the lady on the right here. <laughs> That's Jean Clem Calment. She was French, and she was 121 years old when she celebrated her birthday. I think she passed away just a year or two ago at the age of 122, I think, actually. Uh, so it was just a year ago, I guess. But um, people get to live to be extraordinary ages in occasionally. Got good genes, I guess, right? Genes for longevity. The oldest living person on earth is Kane Tanaka over here on the left. She's Chinese, uh, Japanese, and so she's still alive. And so you can look her up on Wikipedia if you like. So humans, at the very most, get to live maybe 120 years. And of course, you know, the very least, it's, it's almost zero, right? And so uh, at uh, at that kind of range, the average mortality is somewhere in the 70s, or maybe 80, into 80, something like that. And so uh, we, because we don't live very long, have kind of a limited imagination about how we look at the world and how we think our place, our time, and history is much better than any other time. And I don't know if that's a very good way to think about things. Um, in fact, I th I'm pretty sure it's not. So we're going to look at how we look at time now. And so if we've used trees as metaphors, we show the human aspects of it. And now we look at how humans have tried to measure time. Uh, one of these is a water clock here on the, on the right-hand side. The other one is sort of a, 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 
a, uh, well, what do you call it? A sundial, right? It's a sundial that has a vertical sort of aspect to it. And you'd have a stick sitting through that thing and casting a shadow. And you could tell what time of day it was that way. And the water clock in the Chinese tradition, they would actually pay somebody to keep pouring water into the clock. And then you have to keep it perpetually full all the time to measure time. Water clocks and sundials here. They're on the next page here we can see an hourglass those were used on ships very commonly to mark the the shifts okay so if you're on you would do one watch two watch three watch so that's an hourglass so it's, uh, it was an old um, soap opera right as time passes so do the days of our lives you know and so the uh the clock on the left hand side is what they call a candle clock in effect so as the taper burns down you can tell what time it is so what you have to light that one in order to tell time with the one on the right you have to flip it upside down every once in a while but as the sand goes through it you can mark an hour so they're very highly gauged i guess you could say there have been other ways to measure time this is an astrolabe that dates back to 1221 AD. And there's a description of it that goes all the way back to about 1000 uh, AD. And so it shows how it was made. And so you can see how the, the Earth would rotate essentially in this sort of, uh, through the zodiac, I think it is here. So this is another one of these Persian empire sort of constructions. Absolutely brilliant. Now, so this is Islamic culture expressing that scientific value uh, at that time and seeing how things actually work in the natural world. So that's an astrolabe. From the astrolabe, we developed other sorts of devices. And in fact, one of the one of the important advice, uh, devices that was developed was the chronometer. We talked about that a little bit, but how do you measure time and, and use it to to try to keep very accurate time. And that was an, an essential sort of aspect in the 18th century, actually in the 17th century even, to try to navigate around the world. It was in the 18th century, 1759 here, that uh, John Harrison made chronometers. He was competing for a prize, actually. I think there was a prize of about you know, several thousand pounds uh, to develop a timepiece not to develop a timepiece. Let me get this right here. It was to try to determine um, the most accurate way to determine longitude. Now, if you think about it, we have a North Star in the Northern Hemisphere, right? And you always know where you're at on the surface of the Earth as you approach the the North Pole. You would see where the star is becomes more and more elevated all the time. Well, you can tell latitude that way. So you do it in the northern hemisphere off the northern star. In the southern hemisphere, you can project from the southern cross where the south pole should be, where all the stars rotate around it, right? And so you can use the southern cross for that to determine it. And it was difficult to take astronomical observations on a ship that would be rolling with the seas and everything, right? And you had to take measurements at certain times of the, how high is the sun right now and when is it directly overhead? That became a difficult sort of activity, especially when you have a lot of weather and waves and so forth. So Harrison said, well, we can measure, we know what the distance, we know the circumference of the earth. All we have to do is measure the time that it takes to get to a certain um, uh, meridian. And so he developed the the uh, clock. He had an H1 and H2. And this is the H4 right here. So in 1759, that is the chronometer that went around the world on Captain Cook's voyage. And so Captain Cook took that on the second voyage around the world. Um, so uh, here's a picture from that voyage, in fact. So here he is visiting one of his last stops for him, anyway, was in the Hawaiian Islands. He was killed inadvertently. Well, I don't think it was inadvertently. He was murdered there uh, in Kuala Kakua. And, um, and so they were quite upset with him, I guess, the native um, Hawaiians there, and took his life. But, uh, but the voyage continued on even without him. And so that uh, timepiece went on to measure very, very accurately longitude around the world. So timepieces are also good for geographic purposes. So that gets us to the point finally that we can ask things like, what is time? And many times you hear people talk about the space-time continuum. 
really what it is, is like if we go back 13.8 billion years back in the past, that's when there was a giant <laughs> happening, and we know that we're still accelerating from that very event faster and faster because everywhere we look in the in the night sky, as far as we can see, within the cone that we can actually recognize, things are just receding away from us just as rapidly as they can, kind of. They call it the red shift. And so stars are going away from us, and then also the galaxies are like spreading apart, apart as well. And so they call this a space-time continuum, and the space-time continuum is related to, to gravity in some ways. Uh, but in fact, some of the characteristics of time we know that we can describe. You can't go back in time very far. It's only been within the last couple of years. Through quantum physics, they think that you can go back for a split second and, and like, but it, then you're right back, you know? So it's like, so it's, you jump from one state to another state, essentially. You can't go back. As much as you want to, you can't go back. You know, I think that's an old proverb somewhere. Time is also one dimensional in some ways. They, they, it was Eddington who came up with this idea. They call it time's arrow. So if time only goes into the future, we live in the present, goes into the future, in the past. So there's an order to things, right? So past, present, future. And we live in this bubble called the present. And things move around in this bubble. And so that is what that space continuum is. Things change very rapidly. And so that's what's going on in the now. And in the future, we don't know what's there. In the past, we've kind of got a record of that because we can remember it. We can record it. Um, so the past is kind of fixed then. And the present is what is now. And the future is unknown. But it may be predictable, at least in parts, if you do the right things and do, you know, expect things, you know. But it may not happen, too. Um, so there is this idea between two different philosophies of time. And I don't want to get into this too much, but there's this idea of presentism that the present can influence the future. And there are other people who think about eternalism, and they think that in the future, it's already kind of happened before, and we're actually just redoing things. And so there may be multiple channels, I guess you could say, weaving their way into the future. You can watch some video tubes on presentism versus eternalism, but it's not going to be a part of this course. Time is distorted by mass, however. So that's when we were talking about gravity, right? And so if you get close to something, it'll actually distort the time around it. And so they, they often illustrate that with a cone sort of sort of shape. So if you have a planet resting on, let's say, a fishnet or something like that, and you were able to, like, you would see that things would go around and spiral around. Um, and, and it would distort the time. And so time would be distorted around that sort of mass massive uh, body. Um, time can be measured by clocks, but it won't necessarily keep accurate time. There's a lot of things that affect how timekeeping is done. Your altitude off of the surface of the Earth, for instance, will change time. If you're up higher in the atmosphere, you're going to slow down time. If you're closer to the center of the Earth, well, actually, that would slow down time. If you're closer to the center of the Earth, if you're up higher, it's going to speed things up, maybe. Um, with that in mind, okay, so what am I trying to get at with time here? We have to know a little bit about time because this is life of the past. And we're talking about the fossils in the, in the geologic past. Those time periods have names. And so we're going to talk about how those time periods came about. And there are two different concepts in geology. One of them is absolute time and the other one's relative time. In relative time, we can look at the rocks and it'll tell us what happened first, what happened second, what happened third, what happened fourth. That's relative time. It's like a sequence of events, right? We can see what sequence that is by looking at the layers of rock or looking at the types of fossils that are in those rocks. And so that's why paleontology is really important in geology and understand the age of the earth and under, also understanding the evolution of life on this planet as well. It's all related to time. Now, absolute time is a little bit different, and we're going to talk about that as well. So absolute time has to deal with using systems like radiometric age dates and so forth. Don't carbon 14 age dates even work for this, right? And it's how we measure time in geology. So one of the key concepts I want to get across to you is that the absolute time is based on those parameters, so like uranium-238 and uranium-235, and you can actually solve for what the true time is and maybe get it down to within a million or two years of error. 
And that's really good in geology. When we're talking about hundreds of millions of years, if you're plus or minus two million, you're doing really good. With relative time, we can actually kind of do better in some ways. We don't know the exact time, but many times the fossils are stacked up in such a sequence that we see that on many of the continents in the same age rocks. So what you see on the left-hand side here is jo Ogijopsis uh, kiatzi, and so that is a trilobite. And so trilobite species evolve very rapidly in the Cambrian, and so there's trilobite zone, trilobite zone, trilobite zone, and then other trilobite all the way into and up into the, uh, the Permian. And so fossils have given us this record of time as well. And so we use them as clocks, essentially, not just tree rings, right? So we don't have to cut any big, you know, bristlecone pines down to understand time anymore. We're going to leave it at that. This is enough for you to get here. It's 50 minutes of talking with you about time and how we use metaphors and how evolution uses that metaphor and how time uses that metaphor and then how we use absolute and relative age dates in geology. We're going to go into more detail on that. So those will be for the next two lectures, I think it is here. And so anyway, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot.